from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I am your host, Tyler Jorgensen, and today we get to talk with former Division I football athlete Daryl Stinson on what happens after all of that, right? And so we're going to talk about um, him figuring out who he was after sports. We're going to talk about mental health and suicide, and we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, and it's going to be a great journey, and so we're super excited to have Daryl out with us. Welcome to the show, Daryl. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you for everybody tuning in. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have some fun, laugh, cry, play together. If you're driving, just don't get in an accident. That's right. That's right. Please stay safe. All right, Daryl. So um, let's start at the in the middle. Okay? Yeah. So we're going to start in the middle. When did you first realize that you were an entrepreneur? Oh, my God. That's in the beginning, man. I, okay, I that's always good. knew I was an entrepreneur. I, when I was a kid, I, I literally sold colored rocks to my neighbors. And it was kind of like, oh, this cute kid, he uh, took some pain and just threw it on rocks. And I was not artistic. It was terrible. But I, I sold it. You know, I sold my cute kidness, you know. And then, uh, you know, probably when I was a teenager, um, early teens, I did a lawn care business. Just went around cutting lawns. We call it D&D Lawn Care, my cousin Deshaun. And so, man, I've always been entrepreneurial. Love that. I love that. And so you, you've you known early on, right? Like, okay, I'm going to make something for myself. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to, you know, you want some money? Let's sell some rocks, right? Yeah, yeah. You're not going to wait for some handout. You're going to go take action. Oh, absolutely, right? man. Yeah, that's not, that's not my athlete's mentality. Nothing's handed to you. Everything's earned, you know? So, um, and then growing up in a poor neighborhood and my dad was a family of six, uh, he, you know, they had to share socks on Christmas. So he grinded his way just to make sure that I had opportunities to play like travel sports and stuff. So it was just hard work was just ingrained in me. Absolutely. And so you, you were a uh, division one athlete, you were, uh, you know, professional bound. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey of an athlete and kind of what happened. Yeah. So, um, I went to central Michigan University. Central Michigan University played both football and basketball. So uh, I always say it this way. I was ranked number three in the state of Michigan preseason for Mr. Basketball. Number one in the state was Draymond Green. And everybody knows Draymond Green. Nobody knows Daryl Stinson. And so just the the type of caliber player that I was. And then, um, you know, I was also ranked number nine in the entire Midwest for a defensive lineman. So uh, I chose Central Michigan so I could play both. Didn't end up happening. Long story short, uh, you know, they just didn't want me to get hurt playing basketball and football had my scholarship. So yep. I'm still mad at Butch Jones for that. <laughs> so <laughs> go to Alabama and yell at him. But yep. man, um, I'm six foot five. I, I was, uh, you know, gr- agile enough to be good at basketball, but I was big and tough enough to play football. So it wasn't a matter of like, if I was going to go to the league, it was just a matter of when, right? Um, so I, I would hear that from coaches who coached NFL players. And, you know, that was, that's, that's my mentality. You know, I, I played as a freshman. I was on pass rush packages, couldn't defend the run very well because my legs were still skinny, but man, I was talented and very athletic. And, you know, my, my dad was an elite athlete. My aunt was an Olympic athlete. So it runs in our family. So man, it's just, you know, I was born with that gift. Awesome. And so you, I mean, gifted division one athlete planning on going pro. Did you go pro? No, I didn't, man. Okay. I wish. <laughs> what happened? In my head, I went pro. I saw right. it. <laughs> you know, it was almost there. So actually, at the end of my freshman year, I was trying to impress upperclassmen on how much I could squat. So I was trying to say, look at me, a freshman stronger than you. And I came up the wrong way, pinched a nerve in my back. And because I didn't know the difference between being hurt and being injured, I kept going after that injury. And so um, I went for months playing with this pinched nerve in my back. Long story short, my pain got so bad to the point where I couldn't even move my left leg. And then I hit it one day and I noticed like, what the, like my left leg is completely jello. I went and got an MRI. I had to have emergency back surgery because my left leg was getting ready to go paralyzed. The doctor came and did my surgery the next day and he was booked for like three to six months. Wow. So that's how serious it was. So I got the surgery 
And that was supposed to be it, right? Like, dude, you you will honor your scholarship. You're a freshman. You you get a red shirt. You get four years just to focus on education. You can come around football whenever you want. But they didn't understand football was not what I did. It was who I was. It was my yep. identity. Completely. It was my ticket out of the hood. It was the way yep. I was going to be successful by my family, a house, my mom, a car, get everybody out of poverty. <clears throat> I was going to be the superhero. So I wasn't just going to let it go like that. Right. So I begged them to let me on the team, signed a liability waiver so that they would not be liable for my injury or death on the field. And then I literally put my body through extreme discipline, uh, drug addiction to be able to numb my pain to continue to play the game. And I did so with some success. I wasn't supposed to have contact on the field for a year. I was back playing on the field within six months starting because me hurt was better than the next guy fully healthy. And I'm not saying that to brag. That was just the reality. And so I started for two years. I mean, you watch any of my film. I'm like, I'm making plays and stuff, but you can tell I'm just like, this guy's in pain, but he's like a freak of nature. So he's kind of cool to watch. Well, my opioid addiction got so bad to going into my senior year, my, my, the opioids would thin my blood to the point where every time I made contact on the field, my nose would bleed. Oh, wow. So the coaches are like, dude, we don't know what you're doing, but we can't let that happen. They kicked me off the team. And that's when I had to face the fact that I failed at my first love. And so I think anybody that's gone through a major transition, but especially athletes that had um, professional aspirations, right? I feel like that has a unique athletes tend to go all in more than some other people, right? Like I know people that are like, Hey, this is my career. I'm going all in. This is what I'm going to need. But really they're like in the back of their head, they're like, ah, but I could always do C, D, E or F. Right. But athletes are like, I'm going pro. I'm going to be, you know, this is the team I'm going to sign with. Right. Yeah, like yeah. they know everything I'm going first round, third position. They got it all mapped out in their mind. Athletes have a tendency to really have a strong vision. So when that vision changes, there's a whole identity shift. Right. So let's first go through how you dealt with that. Cause I think it led to some real big challenges and then let's talk about how you're helping others. Yeah. So number one, I didn't deal with it. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I didn't face, I didn't want to go there. And, and, and that's, that's the work of mental health. That's the work of anything that they uh, like people don't want to do the inner work a lot of times because it's like, man, I don't want to think about that stuff. I don't want to think about, you know, the, the, problems I have in my house, my marriage or my business. I just want to kind of like keep moving fast. That's what I did. So I'm like, man, I don't want to think about this. I'm just going to do more drugs and I'm just going to like party and like not even think about it and not thinking about it. I was still thinking about it subconsciously. When I went to bed at night, I was just thinking about like the fact that I can do it anymore. So everything I did, I don't recommend, <laughs> which is avoid the problems. And that's what led me to implode. And to the point where I started to make suicide attempts and things like that. So I always um, encourage people, man, like step one is you have to process your pain. You have to process your failures. You have to process your rejection. You have to process the tension that happens in your work days. If you don't, because you're afraid of conflict, you're afraid of what you might find, unprocessed pain will become ill-processed pain. So you know, you mentioned very casually and then just moved on that it led to suicide attempts. And so, you know, that's not a small thing. That's a big deal. And I think, uh, I, I personally have lost way more friends than I want to even say as a number, uh, to suicide. I think it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. I think it's massively under spoken about. And, um, I mean, it's, there's people every day, Right. That are just that are uh, that we're losing to that. And I, I think it's it's absolutely devastating. And I think it happens to athletes, it happens to entrepreneurs, it happens to everyone. It's not like there's not like one group that's immune to it. Yeah. But you said something really powerful that you have to process your pain because non processed pain becomes ill processed pain. Mm -hmm. So let's flip it a little bit and say you're, you're saying you need to process your pain, your failure, your rejection. Yeah. How? What's step one? Yeah. Number one, you have to develop a sense of awareness, right? Okay. And typically, if you're not like an emotional person, which I feel like we're all emotional people, we just got to learn how to like be in tune with our emotions. Uh, but if you're not like that type of person, you, you don't think, you don't meditate, you don't pray. I, I literally tell people, find the tension in your day. Okay. So when in your day was there friction? Uh, when did you feel like you could, you underperform? When did you have a altercation with someone at your work? Start with the friction because there's always an emotion attached to the friction. 
So let's say you 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 get into it with a coworker because they just underperform and y'all you, you, they should have did what you told them to do and they didn't do it and carry out their assignment. So y'all had a little beef at work. I say that's a perfect place to start processing. If you acted out of character, if you if you acted out of um, um, emotion, why don't you start your journal and you say, on that day, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? Okay, and you'll start to see very quickly you were making inaccurate conclusions about that person and typically inaccurate conclusions about yourself. Right. A lot of arguments that happen in the workplace are all about insecurities. (laughs) I'm arguing because I like, you know, me saying I'm better than you makes me feel better about me. We don't know that because we don't process. So step one is to develop a sense of awareness. Step two is to slow down enough to actually journal and start to come up with accurate conclusions about what you were thinking and feeling. Okay. Because if you remember unprocessed pain becomes ill processed pain. So if you take that same scenario and you don't process, you just go the next day. Here's the conclusion you start to make. They're underperforming. They don't like me. I I should find a different company. I'm not respected at work. All of that stuff is conclusions that you made. And that might not even be the truth, right? That's just stuff that you made up because you didn't feel like dealing with your emotions. So you sit down, you reflect, you analyze, and you reframe. Reflect, analyze, reframe. And so that gives you an opportunity to get out of the emotional state that mm-hmm. where you had lack of awareness and get into the rational state where you're saying, okay, what are, what's actually happening? Right? Exactly. And, what is it, and, how, and how does it actually impact me? Um, mm-hmm. that's, that's important, right? So how did, you know, what was your next step? So you, you said, I think 2011, you attempted to take your life, right? Failed. I'm glad you failed on that, right? Good failure. What did what happened in your life next that got that led you to where you are now? Yeah, so I ended up in a psychiatric unit, um, and there I had this crazy life changing experience that gave me a dangerous four letter word called hope. And the moment I had hope, it was over because it was like giving Michael Jordan the the ball with three seconds left. I was like there's purpose beyond my pain. I I survived this and and it's for a reason. And so after that, I became very zealous about finding out what my purpose was. And I wasn't settling for generic purpose statements. I believe that if I survived suicide, it was for a specific reason because I was unique and I was meant to be here on this earth. So I wasn't settling for like generic purpose statements of like, my purpose is to help other people discover their purpose, or my purpose is to leave a good legacy to my children. I'm like, who doesn't want to help other people? Who doesn't want their children to have a good future? What is unique about me? And so I I was a nerd, man. I went to the library. I would study for hours a day. I spent thousands of dollars. I read, you know, Victor Frankl's The Man's Search for Meaning, Simon Sinek's Why. I mean, anything on purpose, meaning it didn't have to be about faith or religion. It could just be anything abstract. I studied it all. And I came to this point. I'm like, this, this is me. This is unique. And this is my purpose. And the way that I express my purpose is through speaking, it's through writing, it's through business, it's through entrepreneurship. I have multiple expressions of my purpose, but there's a higher purpose, a why that drives everything that I do. And when I found that thing, I was like, what's next? Well, now I got to come become a lead at it. I can't be the top one or 2% in one industry of athletes and then just be the bottom <laughs> in this other. So now I got to become one of the best speakers. I got to become one of the best entrepreneurs. And so I'm on that journey now, currently two-time TEDx speaker, best-selling author that comes from this drive to be great because I know that greatness is inside of me. And so uh, that's where I'm at currently in this journey. Awesome. So now you're focusing on your journey and your, your purpose, right? But then, so you're speaking, you've got your book, Mm-hmm. Um, what's, uh, what are your big goals going into 2021? I, I don't mean this to be generic, man. It's okay. I, I'm, I'm, this is so serious. I want to help as many people as possible. Cool. Who do you um, want to help? I want to help people who are struggling with mental health issues. I want to help our youth who have no clue how to, how to handle social peer pressure. No, no clue how to make responsible decisions, no clue how to know who they are and be comfortable in who they are. Nobody likes to be the kid that doesn't have a seat at the lunch table. So I want to help our youth and I want to help our athletes. There's a ton of athletes who are in transition. There's a ton of athletes who've been out of sports for years and they're still living their current life as if it's second best to their former life. 
Yep. And that's no way because there, you know, there's this term in sports and you've heard it. Glory days. You ever heard glory days? What does that oh, yeah, mean? Absolutely. It's it means my best days are behind me. <laughs> that's no way to live. And yep. so um, I'm passionate about helping athletes in our youth. I've, I've worked with quite a few former professional athletes, college athletes, things like that. And it is absolutely a, a challenge for them to go through that transition because it is, it's a, they feel like it's a stepping out of the spotlight mm. and therefore they can't be as impactful, yeah. but really in many ways they're about to be, they have the greater capacity because they're not bound by league restrictions, management restrictions. You know, I mean, when, when you're, when you're a professional athlete, your life's not your own. Yeah. You don't get to make decisions on your own. You don't mm -hmm. get to live the way you really genuinely want to live. So I think the opportunity actually increases, but it is a reframe like you talked about earlier. And, uh, yeah. and the glory days can be absolutely ahead of them. Um, we've yeah. had quite a few professional athletes on this, um, on this program. We've had um, Rick Meyer, who was, you know, quarterback from Notre Dame and then oh, you know, went boo. pro, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about the good days of his, of his career and that he's rated as one of the all time top 10 draft bus. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, yeah, but I mean, we've, we've had quite a few others. I could, I could go through a list, but we gotta get, and, I, uh, I got to send you some Chippewas, man. You know, yeah. we got some play Antonio Brown, Eric Fisher. He's number one draft pick. Those, those yep. are the real dogs, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. we, there's there's some good ones trust me if you went through the list you'd see there's some great great athletes that we've had on the show yeah. um but uh it's a lot of them go through that same thing and it's i i love how many of them transition into entrepreneurship because i think that there is something about being an athlete and creating your best self that transitions so well over to, into entrepreneurship yeah. the difference is you no longer have uh the restrictions Right. Mm -hmm. You don't have the the coach, you know, telling you exactly what to do. You don't have somebody else telling you, here's the play you have to run. So you get given an open playbook, mm -hmm. right? And you get to choose your own adventure now. So what would what helped you like when you got hope? What mm -hmm. helped you start deciding which path to channel that into? Yeah. So number one, it was understanding my highest purpose. That was very important to me. I knew I could be successful at another career. But I need to know that I had a higher purpose. So I, I found that out and I had a unique purpose statement um, that defined everything that I do, that, that defined, that drives everything I do. And so from there, I went, OK, now what am I good at? What am I talented at? What what do I feel called a purpose to do? And I started and I just made a list. OK, I can talk a little bit. I can rap a little bit. I, I, I got um, some leadership ability and I just kind of wrote it down, even if it was still in seed form or like I wasn't like fully developed at it. Sure. It's like, man, other people see this as a gift that I have or a skill that I have. Right. And then I went, well, how do I make money doing that? <laughs> and literally that's the process. So I went and I said, okay, well, I can speak. Well, you know, I don't have any opportunity yet. So, you know, um, I went and talked to a couple of people, spoke in front of my team. That was easy. Spoke in front of another high school team. I said, you know, you do a good job. You get invited to speak more. And then I started down that path. And then I, I had a, a liking to marketing. Um, you, you you know what you're called to because what you're bo bothered by, you're often called to be a solution to that problem. Sure. So, so when I ride by and I see billboards or Facebook ads or whatever, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. They're wasting so much money. I'm frustrated by it, you know, and that's, that means that I'm probably supposed to be a solution to that problem. And so I got into marketing. I worked for Central Michigan University in their marketing department. We did a rebrand when number three, uh, higher education and award um, for a marketing campaign. And uh, as part of a team, did some really cool stuff there. And um, and then I went and branched out and started doing marketing consulting, which was really still speaking. Yep. And I, I was passionate about helping underdogs win because there's people, um, meaningful nonprofits, even meaningful for-profit organizations that are losing in business because they don't know how to market. Sure. And I, yeah, I was equipping them. So yeah, that's how I got in. And, you know, just keep getting better and better and improving and watching the film, studying yourself. Don't be afraid to ask people, how did I do? And, and you got to ask people who will tell it to you straight. <laughs> how did I really do? You know? Yep. Uh, so, well, the nice thing uh, is about marketing is that it's not an opinion based thing, right? In the end, oh, the data speaks. It and, works or it uh, don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the numbers. Now, the challenge is being able to, to understand the numbers well enough to make smart decisions and not, you know. Yep. You know, because a lot of times people are a headline tweak away from something working, but they they stop everything altogether. 
That's or crazy. the other way around, right? They keep pouring money on the on something that's just not working. So yeah, or what? it's actually the back end of their business that's actually bringing in the revenue, and the and the ad itself was terrible. It's just that it's you know not as marketed or popular or like especially some of these bigger companies, man. Some of these banks run the worst marketing campaigns. Oh, absolutely. And no, this like, big big business has not adjusted. Most of them have mm-hmm. not adjusted to marketing in today's day and age. They yeah, but they're carried on by their. Uh, by their success that that they can exactly. eat millions and millions of dollars of advertising waste. Um, so exactly. It's a little bit unfair for those of us trying to, to scrap up, yeah, but know. that's okay. I don't, I don't need, uh, we don't need that. Um, that's why we got the business ninja, man. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, so what, uh, you know, as we come into kind of the end of the year, getting ready for next year, what are some big things? So you said you want to help as many people as possible, right? I'm sure you've got some milestones that you want to be hitting. Um, you know, what, uh, with Daryl Stinson.com and with second chance athlete, what are some big things coming? Yeah. So I'm really passionate about helping people tell their stories. And so I'm launching my first mastermind in February to help speakers build out innovative six figure speaking brands that align with their highest purpose. Um, I just feel like there's so many people who have a story to tell, but either they don't know the industry or they don't know how to tell their story or they're deeply insecure. And they like me, they want to hide behind somebody else's success instead of being in the forefront. And so I'm going to help raise up the next 10 to 15 speakers. So my, my mastermind is called the next up um, speaker because I I really want to help people elevate their brand. So that that's definitely a goal for me. Um, I want to give away a million dollars in scholarship funds for second chance athletes uh, to send athletes to go back to school. I'm very passionate about that. I had that opportunity when I worked for university to go retake undergraduate classes Right. So I feel like I got a second chance to succeed in life without the demands of sports. I had the right degree. I just didn't have the experience because sports took up too much of my time. Sure. So I want to give athletes that same experience and pay it for it. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I really want to continue to get more and more messages about people who say, hey, you stopped me from, you know, going down a really dark suicidal train of thought path. And um, you helped me to hang in there and fight another day. Okay. I love it. So when you're, you know, you've got a couple of big things, you've got your book, you've got your, uh, you got your speaking gigs, you've got your mastermind you're launching, right. With all these things, right. How do you decide which thing, uh, gets your attention and which thing you're going to really put your energy into? Yeah. So some of it's timing, like, uh, my book, uh, who my after sports wasn't going to go to market into 2021, but when the pandemic hit, I was like, I'm sitting on a solution to the a big, huge problem right now. So we pushed it to market early. So some of it's timing, um, mentorship. Uh, I've got an advisory board, people who I talk to are further down the road than I am, who I kind of bounce ideas back. And then what I'm learning, honestly, that I didn't get right enough is following my freaking gut, man. Like I, it's just, you know, I let some people who were like eight figure earners kind of direct me in a path because you know, out of best interest for me, but it wasn't true to my core, man. And I wasted money doing stuff that like was their advice and it was good advice, but it just like whatever is in your gut, you're going to throw yourself at. And so I'm really passionate about following my gut more and, um, and really just, um, choosing what I want. So like, like, like for instance, they want me to do a rebrand of my book and do, um, who am I after this so that we can expand it to other industries right? Military transition, second chance divorce, second chance entrepreneurs. But in my gut, I've got this other book that is for inner city youth called Street Lies, L-I-E-S. And I'm like, I'm publishing that thing next year. It's going to be a New York Times bestseller. And I don't care if it's like not the best marketing strategy. It's what my gut's telling me to do. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. I think like I was saying earlier about marketing, sometimes being data driven can has a negative thing, right? There's There can be a negative intention, which is like, well, I might be able to sell more books if I do that, but I won't be as passionate about it. So therefore the book probably won't be as good and I won't want to market it as aggressively. So like you've got to take advice that comes from other people and distill it through the filter of your passion, your yeah. goals, your beliefs, yes. or your gut, like you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Let me leave you with this, man. Um, Eric Thomas said something that changed my life as a speaker. He's doing this little private lunch and he's training and he's like blowing it out the park, man. Everybody's in awe. And he's like, a lot of you are impressed by me as a speaker and you think it's because I'm better than you. In reality, I'm just more free than you. And when he said that, I was like, 
Oh, why? Because we get so trapped in what should do and how we should act and what we should wear that we're not ourselves. That is why authenticity is the new form of currency. Vulnerability is the new form of currency. If we can show up authentic and vulnerable, I'm telling you, it's going to transform. We're going to see more innovation. We're going to see more creativity. And I think the pandemic is gifting that to us. So what is something that you've you've done that's stepping into your authentic self and like removing the mask of masculinity, like, or like removing that mask, what you think other people, other people think you should be right. What's Ooh, something you've done? Yes, that is a great question. I'm so glad you asked me that. So my next TEDx talk is going to be on that. It's going to call it, Hey, misfits come out of hiding. The world needs you. So stay tuned for that. But um, one thing that I do is so I talked about following your gut. Your gut usually requires risk, right? So in marketing, you're supposed to have one problem that you solve and you're supposed to solve it well, right? So for my podcast, I had, who when I said yes, and it was all about helping people find their yes moments, but I didn't like it because there is a business side of me. There is a mother Teresa side of me, and there is a guy that raps side of me. So my next um, podcast relaunch is going to be the Daryl Stinson show. And I'm literally going to have three different outfits of me making three different completely faces on the front. I don't know if it's going to work, but I tell you what, it's going to be authentic. And I'm going to do Monday motivation. I'm going to do Tuesday mental health. I'm going to do Thursday, whatever I want to talk about. Why? Because it's my gut. So that's one way. It's not advised, but... I can already see the difference of your energy level. Just I'm getting excited to talk to you. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, because we're trapped. We're trapped, dude. It's all yeah. stiff. Like, well, if somebody, just, uh, yeah, if someone said, if, if you've been told your whole life, entrepreneurs have to look like this, yeah, you're like, but I want to rap. Yeah. So like one of my friends that owns a big product business, he, he raps just because he loves it. And he now blends it into his marketing and into his stuff because he's like, yeah, I enjoy it. It's what I'm going to have fun doing. So I might as well do it because otherwise I'm just gonna be frustrated. I'm not, yeah. I mean, making content I don't even enjoy. Yeah. And so, uh, I'll have to send you some of his stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty. Oh man, I love to check it out, man. So I love to check it out. Yeah. Well, awesome. Daryl, really appreciate you coming out on the show. Everyone, please go check out DarylStinson.com as well as second chance athlete athletes.com. Um, Daryl, parting words, big advice. What's one thing people can do today to build momentum in their business? It's the simplest yet the hardest thing to do because being yourself opens you up for the greatest form of rejection. But I'd rather you be real and be rejected than to be fake and be accepted. Be you. Amazing, Daryl. Appreciate you coming out on the show. My Biz Ninjas, wherever you're tuning in, it is your turn to go out and do something. Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.